We're almost streaming live. We may be streaming live. My mom. All right, I think we're there. Great to have you all. And thank you for such a fantastic conversation just now. Um, I'm Laura Flanders and I'm here for a very brief talk back, I think this week with some of the guests from this week's episode. This week was our Meet the BIPOC Press episode. You're getting into the habit now. It's the last, it's the last week of every month. Uh, this month, the focus was very much on how the BIPOC Press has some different responsibilities, perhaps some different metrics and covers some candidates perhaps differently. We're talking, we were focusing on the election coverage given to <laughs> Eric Adams, who stands poised to be New York City's next African-American democratic mayor. Um, let me bring you in for the conversation right away. Sarah, Mitra, um, we have with us two of your guests from the show, Julissa and Felipe, both of you amazing work. And Felipe, congratulations. It was very exciting to me to see uh, that URL Media, this new network of black and brown owned and operated community media had its very own reporter covering the race. Um, Felipe, I hope that you will go on to cover many more races. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but any thoughts? Was it different covering this race for URL versus the work you've done in the past? Well, sure. You know, I think um, I've done uh, work for a number of outlets here in New York, right, and, and political for some time, but certainly it was a little bit different in the, you know, in the approach. I think we were trying to kind of think through like what uh, our neighbors here in some of the, you know, the community I live in Harlem, you know, Mitra is out in uh, Jackson Heights, kind of thinking of that voter, um, so what some of their thoughts would be, right? If you were talking in a barbershop or, you know, a, a restaurant or something like, you know, more so what they would be asking or wondering about perhaps, uh, and not necessarily, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the coverage kind of focusing very much on, you know, political groups and intrigue and that sort of thing. So I think, it, you know, it was definitely an interesting experience. I, you know, I've enjoyed it, <laughs> you know, working with, with URL and, and kind of trying to, to think through this coverage in, in a little bit of a different way, for sure. And Sarah, Mitra, maybe you, Sarah, did you have any thoughts watching the show in this context? Because again, there's another kind of meta thing happening once we get to the Laura Flanders show audience. Uh, in the sense that you are broadcasting to public television, to um, stations all across the country. We needed to be thinking about national audience, but we're also suddenly no longer just talking to the URL audience. Not that you ever just talk to anybody, but um, it's another interesting layer I was thinking about as I watched this week's show. Sarah. Yeah, I think that um, there were a few things that really stuck out to me, the, the double standard. I think that that's something that, um, you know, we, we struggle with um, really trying to cover black and brown candidates in, um, in substantive ways, but also recognizing that as the, the, the BIPOC press, you still have to hold them accountable for their actions. And so um, I think that, but I also think that as I think Julissa said during the episode, that a lot of times, if you are black or brown or a woman, there are these um, this this higher bar that you have to to reach for, you have to 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 jump over in order to because there's an an implicit um, assumption that either you're not as qualified or there's something you know nefarious going on. Uh, and, and so you have to really battle all of this, this implicit bias or explicit bias as a, a black and brown candidate. And so as the BIPOC press, you're trying to hold these things um, at the same time. You don't want to buy into those assumptions and you have to uh, make sure that you cover these candidates objectively and, and comprehensively. So. Mitra, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I was just thinking of something I tweeted this morning that exemplifies what we're talking about. So one of the first South Asian electeds I mentioned, um, one is from our district in Jackson Heights, Shaker Krishna, and the other is Shahana Hanif uh, from Brooklyn. And I guess she had a celebration party yesterday in Prospect Park, uh, which is a 
image that'll be familiar to you know much of the country, very green, very Brooklyn, kind of very brownstone Brooklyn like hangs out here, but it was hosted by the Bangladeshi Ladies Club. And so her party was like all these hijabis. And you know, for me to say that it was like colorful feels almost, um, uh, well, kind of cliche, but I'm gonna say it's colorful because I'm South Asian too and I'm wearing this vest. So I, I feel like I can say that. Um, and look, I'm gonna say like, Am I supposed, I'm supposed to cover this race objectively, right? Epicenter covers New York City. And yet when I see this image, there is a part of me that feels similarly celebratory with these women. I don't usually see city council women, first of all, a city council woman, but also um, people coming into elected politics and the civic engagement process, right? So it's not just about the politician, but think the Bangladeshi Ladies Club is hosting her victory party in like, what's a pretty kind of gentrified space of Prospect Park. So I, um, I love this conversation we just had because for me as both a journalist, as well as uh, someone who experiences New York very much in this latter image, it means I have to equally cover that joy of seeing your own person in government and kind of what that represents as I do the policy and um, of course the issues that are of great import as we talked about in the, in the conversation. Now that I think is like a pretty new frontier uh, for me, but definitely for a predominantly white press corps. Uh, it's room nine as, as we call um, the folks who cover city hall in New York City. Julissa, you want to come in on this also? Sitting there nodding. Yeah, you know, I think, and Mitra, everyone kind of has hit it on the head from different angles. I think that there is actual strength in the coverage from someone who lives in the neighborhood, right? Reporters that live in the neighborhood, reporters that have diversity in their own background and in their own voice. Um, it is a challenge. It's a challenge to have to balanced uh, accountability, which I am 100% believe that if we elect people of color, people of color have to respond like any other elected official, right? They have to respond to their constituents and to the issues. Um, but also it's nice to not have to explain, you know, what's happening in a particular neighborhood or when, you know, you in, in the district I used to represent, I think we had a parade and Felipe could probably, and Nature could speak to this, like a parade for every country. And they all wanted their separate parade. There wasn't the Hispanic parade, which existed, but then every other country had their own parade and the importance of celebrating culture. Um, and I remember having a debate with someone that said, well, why don't you just do one parade? This is such a waste of resources. And you know, then you kind of got into the conversation of, well, everyone has their own identity and everybody wanted their own time. Um, and but from the NYPD's perspective, they're like, we have to close these streets every Sunday. <laughs> Um, why, why can't you just have one big parade? Um, so it's an interesting uh, new phase that we're going to be having in the council, but I think that's what's going to make this council the, the strongest ever is its diversity um, and the fact that there's going to be 30 women, right? That's, that's historic. I can't wait to see um, the diversity, but also not only from the mayor, just the mayor being elected is the fact of who's going, who he's going to appoint to all these agencies and as agency heads, right? So they're also, that's another level of accountability that I, I'd like to see, but also I think another moment of pride that we're gonna see in this, in this city, because I think there's gonna be some historic appointments there as well. I think there's gonna be some historically sexist headlines in the New York Post, um, but hey, that's maybe being too negative. I mean, listening to this conversation, I. There's so many things come up and, and one before I want to, you know, before we go any further, I would just say that um, we lost a, an important member of, of the black media this, I think it was this week, uh, in Glenn Ford, who for so many years headed up the Black Agenda Report, um, a very different generation with a very different agenda. Um, that outlet was adamantly determined to critique white press, to a put out um, particularly a black agenda informed by um, Pan-Africanism and bring a Pan-African perspective to US foreign policy and domestic policy. I'm sure you knew him, Sarah, or had exchanges with him over the years, maybe not so much. I did a little. I found him incredibly 
willing to listen and, and generous in, in coming on shows that I'd done. Um, but it was a sad loss. He had been a big present for a long time and very generous to young reporters coming up. So I just wanted to name his loss and, and uh, appreciate his determined effort to keep the Black Agenda Report going in years when it was not easy to keep that going. But it really did raise for me this question of, wow, the role of, for example, a Black media outlet has got many more options now. Um, you're not just hammering down a door. I mean, you're not just covering um, a Black power movement. You are, I think of Charles Blow with his new um, BNC News show. He's doing like an MSNBC talk show um, with a Black audience, with a Black focus um, online. Uh, it's a little bit frustrating to me because the stories aren't that different from what you're hearing elsewhere. So I'm not sure you're expanding the realm of stories that get covered, but you are seeing different perspectives on some of the same stories. So you can see lots of things going on in my head. Sarah, um, I know there are always lots of things going on in yours. Well, I, I did not know Glenn Ford. Um, I had not met him. Um, but oh. what I do know is that there is a long history of, um, you know, in, in terms of black media and, you know, I think it's so important to name those people who were pioneers, were who continued the legacy of a, a Frederick Douglass, of a Freedom's Journal, of a Ida B. Wells. You know, these these people who um, you know risked life and limb literally to establish an independent Black voice. And as we see right now, when you when you mention um, when you mention Charles Blow and and others. You know the the need for these independent voices is more is is as important as it was in 1827 when Freedom's Journal was the first black newspaper was launched. So you know things have things have evolved, but um, we do need to name those who have come before and can and recognize our role in kind of this continuum. And you know it's it's I guess things are getting a little bit easier. I would say since 2020, <laughs> you know, it's only been a year since things have gotten a little bit easier because black media was starved for centuries prior to 2020, literally it's been a year, one year. Um, and I can, I can tell you that from personal experience having been in a black media entrepreneur my entire career. So, you know, we'll see how sustainable this, um, this, this recognition of the importance of black and brown audiences and and black and brown media is, but you know, URL is here to to make sure that those who have made um, pronouncements and pledges to support black and brown communities actually do it, and that's part of what we will be covering. You're muted, Laura. <laughs> Thanks, Mitra. To you and to anyone else who wants to jump in on this, to what extent do you feel that you're responsible for explaining? terms like defund the police. I mean, you mentioned it, Julius, I think you did too, Mitra, that um, this is a phrase coming out of movements that wasn't well understood. I'm, as a movement journalist, and I don't even pretend to claim to be objective, um, I'm always taught, is it my job to explain this as a journalist? I think our answer is to bring on lots of activists who explain it as well as they possibly can. Um, but what do you think is the job of the journalist in that moment, if perhaps the movement's perhaps aren't doing that well at explaining what they mean or just don't get enough airtime to explain what they mean. But you do know because you've looked at it, you've studied it, you work on it, Mitra. Well, I would say that um, I feel like it is our job uh, to explain for sure. I mean, I, I feel like we, we talked a lot in this episode itself about context and, and the need to offer that. Um, but I don't think it's our job to be in the pocket of organizers to the extent that, um, I mean, you know, even like as recently as um, universal healthcare, right? Like just think about um, how much we failed. So, so yes, the left, I think, has a failure in messaging in moments of critical need, right? If you asked most Americans, do you want affordable healthcare or universal healthcare? They would say yes, and yet, you know, post uh, one of the worst economic crises in a generation, we had such a failure in communication. And so that's the piece where just myself as someone who considers herself pretty good at 
headlines and making things go viral and, you know, tries to um, study digital media and the consumption of concept, right? Um, that's an area where I feel like it's not my job again to serve as the mouthpiece for that, but it is my job. And I think um, uh, uh, Charles in the episode talked about policy and the problem we have with policy uh, just from a consumption perspective is you say policy and most people's eyes glaze over. And so for me, it becomes this, how do I break these concepts down? You know, it's almost like you are trying to achieve virality and understanding to understand how this might help people. Is that on the left or the right? Or, you know, I mean, I, similar to you, Laura, I don't claim to be objective. Um, I do think I'm pretty good at talking to communities assessing what they say they want and what their needs are and linking them to information that can uplift them in a certain moment. And so if that means, uh, oh, you know, there is affordable healthcare in New York and it's being called something else and you are suspicious of that, is it my job as the journalist to kind of um, translate these two information misses to each other? I think absolutely yes. Um, on defund the police, I'm going to leave that to Felipe and Julissa. I'm not. I'm not tossing. I just. I don't know the answer to that one. So I. I would love some uh, advice. Julissa, I. I hear. I see a toss. Quite obviously, to you. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm excited to also hear Felipe's angle on this. I think that you. You mentioned this earlier, and I think it is important for the media to be able to rise as many voices in this conversation, right? Highlight all the perspectives. One thing with the progressive movement and the defund the police, I think people were really approaching this from different angles. Um, I had a, a personal different perspective because I know what it was like to be in 2014 and 2015 fighting with the NYPD on their overtime budget and not understanding why their overtime budget was so high and saying you have to identify opportunities, either you need to hire more people or there's you need to right size this budget, there's something wrong. And we shouldn't be paying um, time and a half for officers because they need to be uh, in certain positions or, or following up certain uh, investigations. So I kind of was more in the nitty gritty. So when I hear it from the police, it kind of reminds me of like, well, are we going to be in a position where we're gonna have left, less officers um, and then just have the NYPD tack this defunded portion to overtime. So we're going to be in the same space. So I felt like we should really be having a, uh, a, a kind of deep dive on the budget and identifying real change through, you know, fiscal policy, but just kind of outright defunding without kind of all the details, I think was very important for us to be able to better communicate. Okay. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, my, my perspective and I and I teach journalism, too, and I try to hammer this with, you know, with my students as well, which is that, you know, I'm very big on the concept of, of context. Right. And, and I think that trying to clarify certain concepts isn't only something we should be doing. It's an absolute responsibility because otherwise you get kind of these situations where people there's there's these sort of ideas that are driving public discussion. Right. And driving opinion. But people are like talking past each other because they're not actually talking about the same things, right? And so, you know, I think to fund the police is a great idea. I mean, look at the whole kerfuffle now with critical race theory, which is an interesting academic concept, right? Which has a lot of sort of, you know, I mean, there's a lot to talk about there, but the conversation that's happening is almost completely devoid of the actual reality of what that concept means. And I think, I mean, to, to a certain extent that happens with a lot of, you know, other policy issues like to fund the police where, you know, I think, if we're gonna have an informed conversation as a public, right? And as a press that, you know, is supposed to be assisting this public, you know, we need to know what it is exactly that is actually being discussed, right? What, what the proposals are themselves. And so saying to fund the police and leaving it at that, I don't think is useful because, well, A, there's not really one single to fund the, poli the, fund the police movement, right? I mean, there's people, you know, running the gamut from, we should constrain some of these overtime costs, as Julissa was saying, you know, we need to, you know, root out fraud, waste and abuse, you know, we need to uh, examine these settlements that are costing the city, you know, $300,000 a piece, you know, and, and why are we having these problem cops that are getting four or five settlements over a few years, right? So it, it goes everything from that to people who are like, 
let's slash the budget by 90% and, you know, and, and sort of shift it to, um, you know, mental health services and these other things. So there's like a whole spectrum, even within that one phrase of different approaches. And so I think, you know, it, 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 these are really important questions of, of, of local public policy. And so if, if we're going to have these discussions, you know, we can't limit ourselves uh, just to headlines. You know, we, we really need to be making sure that people, you know, that, 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 and that we can find a way to have it be kind of an elevator pitch to someone too, because, you know, people out there, you know, are busy and, you know, not everyone is, is, is going to read, you know, a 3000 word essay on, on what all these things mean. So we have to find ways to, to, to kind of be able to explain these things to people in a way that, that makes sense to them, that is concise, that they can then, you know, explain to other people, right. That they can tell their uncles and their friends and stuff, you know? I, so I think that's, a, I do feel that that's a crucial responsibility of us as journalists and, you know, as people that are trying to, you know, engage with the public in a way that's productive. Well, I'm going to use this opportunity to remind our audience that there are at least two or three episodes of the Laura Flanders show speaking specifically to some of these questions. One on defund the police that I would strongly recommend was our piece about the state, the city budgets of of, um, of Compton and Stockton, uh, which featured some of those who were part of the Movement for Black Lives who had spent months engaging with the local community, with the electorate, getting them to actually talk on the doorsteps about how they would distribute the budget. Um, they brought that to city council in LA and the people who organized that are part of our show. Also Michael Tubbs from Stockton was on that episode and he talked about what defund meant to him. His movie, My Stockton, just got an Emmy, I believe. Um, we were proud to have him on the show. And then the episode that we did just recently about critical race theory with Soledad O'Brien and Kimberly Crenshaw, I would encourage you to check out too. Um, but that brings me to my next and perhaps last question, although it's a bummer, which is we find when we do any show related to race, if race is anywhere, race, racism, white supremacy, any mention of the word appears in an episode description, the chat, prior to any broadcast, so nothing that anybody has ever seen, um, is filled up with just hate. Um, and I just fit, take it upon myself mostly to get rid of it because I feel like, what's the point? On the other hand, I think it's a constant reminder of where we are in America, but it's also a distraction from the conversation that we want to be having. So it happens every single time. And I want us to be past this point, but we're still in this point. And um, I'm sure it happens to some extent on every, in, in every media outlet. Um, but I'd love your thoughts on um, beating back, you know, fighting back against some of this. And it did occur to me also in the context of mayoral elections and mayoral governance, because I was reminded through your episode to go back and look at, well, how did David Dinkins deal with the media? Um, and in his first term, I, I read a piece in Rolling Stone that reported how in his first term, Roger Ailes from Fox News tried to use exactly the same tactics against Dinkins that he went on to use, uh, well, had already used at the federal level, throwing um, very viral, ver that, that era's version of a viral video, um, against Dinkins, accusing him exactly of what you talk about, corruption, letting people out of jail, who went on to commit crimes, the whole Willie Horton thing. And if you don't know what Willie Horton is, viewers, go look it up. Um, and Dinkins was having none of it. And he threw it back at Ailes and made Ailes the subject and the problem. And now it worked for his initial election, it obviously did not work a uh, second time around. But I wonder if we could hear from you in closing, just. Any advice on how do we keep our eyes on the prize to do the reporting we want to do, not ignore that the hate is out there, but also not, not let ourselves be derailed by it, whether we're journalists or electeds or just members of the electorate, as you say, Mitra. Maybe start with you, Mitra. So I um, am nodding vehemently because I just I just looked it up to make sure I was right. But I had written a piece for Fortune, right? I, I write a mainstream, very, very mainstream media column. And uh, I wrote about vaccines this week and had nothing, you would think it had nothing to do with race, but I just looked up indeed my Facebook um, messages. So people go up and look me up online 
are filled with exactly what you're describing. And this one guy writes to me, I, I won't read it all, but he was like, uh, you know, sort of mind your own business. And last but not least, you're Muslim ass, right? So first of all, I'm not Muslim, but that's besides the point. Um, and so, and, and I just share that because I was like, oh, this just happened to me. This happens to me all the time. And so I think it exactly exemplifies the point of why I do the work I do, why URL media exists. And yet sometimes I think in communities of color, we're so used to that being our norm that then I'll turn on the TV and I'll be watching a discussion on critical race theory or the discussions of January 6th or immigration reform. And it's allegedly a liberal, I use that in quotes, uh, show and it's all white people talking about it, right? And so, you know, I, this is gonna sound so simplistic, but my response to you is that we just keep doing the work. I mean, I think we probably need to, the one thing I see that my uh, peers and perhaps folks younger than me do is they'll screen grab, like that guy who just sent me that, e that email, I see that all the time where people will like take his profile and make that go viral and be like, this is this guy sending me this BS, right? I've never done that because I came of age in a very different journalism where you just accepted that harassment as a part of doing your job every day. Um, so maybe there's a generation younger than us that, you know, are like, not only are we going to show you how it's done, but we're going to expose the racists while we're at it. Um, and maybe I should do that. Maybe when I get off the, well, I don't, I, I did report him to Facebook for what it's worth. I, I, I did. I, I, we have your back, Mitra. We have I your do. back. Go Thank for you. it. <laughs> uh, Julissa, Felipe, want to come in? I also think it's important that we don't lose sight of, not only do we have to do these jobs, we have to do these jobs with these disgusting comments and pressures behind us. So I always like to remind the women that I speak to or anyone that I have, you know, that I'm helping is like, that makes you even that more amazing, right? Um, and it's also a moment, I think, for the allies to really, for the first time, because it's like in print and it's comments and it's public, for us, we'll get, we used to get it in the mail, we used to get it in our emails. And like Mitra mentioned, we kind of ignored it or we use it as like energy to do better and, and be great. Um, it's exhausting. It is, you know, unfair. It is the job, you know, we have to do these jobs with these added pressures and just, you know, this negative negativity constantly thrown at us. And I just think, you know, what if people of color and women could lead without any of this? Like how much would we, we rise with all this? Um, so I, I think it's really more a moment of shock for our allies because it's more evident uh, I'm not shocked by it. I still, you know, I still see it and I'm out of office. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, we just kind of rise above it. And I'm not shocked that David Dinkins went through it. And, you know, we saw it with Obama. We saw it. We continue to see it. We'll see it now more so. I mean, some of the, the, the most hurtful um, uh, commentary that I saw was Melissa Margarito when she was Speaker of the City Council. Like, you know, it was, it was the extreme. I had never seen such, like, just disgusting commentary um, kind of thrown at an elected official. So, you know, for non-people of color, they get all the grace and all the honor. And then when we, the people of color in office, it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, we, this is what we think of you and let's remind you every step of the way. And we just kind of are trained to, well, let me show you how, I'm not even gonna do it, I'm gonna do it even better. Um, but not everyone can ride that. Like that is real pressure that no one should have to go through. What was the Ginger Rogers said about dancing with Fred Astaire? I do everything that he does backwards in high heels. Yeah. Felipe, Sarah, Felipe. Any um, closing thoughts? Yeah, I don't want to. Now that uh, Julissa mentions, uh, you know, Melissa Margaret Root, I'm reminded of how current Republican mayoral candidate Curtis Slewa was, you know, temporarily tossed off his New York One show for saying things about her that I won't repeat here. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, I mean, I think like it, it you know, and I, I cover immigration primarily, you know, when I'm not sort of doing political coverage and, you know, that, I mean, that's like the concentrated version of all of this stuff that you're talking about because people feel extremely strongly about it and they don't know the first thing about it. it it's almost like an inverse relationship between just how strident these people are 
and how little they know about how the system actually works. And I think it's important to, to sort of remember too, to not lose sight of the fact that, you know, they, these might be individual reactions by individual people, but this is this part of a system, right? These people are being stoked to do these things by people like Roger Ailes, right? I mean, he's not around anymore, but there's plenty more, you know, like him. And now we have, you know, all these, all this culture war media, you know, we, we, we can't forget there's been a flourishing of, um, you know, like, you know, community and ethnic media and black owned media and all these things, which is great, but there's also been a, a sort of simultaneous flourishing of all of this kind of, you know, granulated, like extreme right and, and, and like identity, you know, white identity media almost, right? I mean, that's just openly, you know, and, and a lot of people are, are kind of gravitating to that sort of thing. And so that's definitely something that concerns me, right? That there's like all these entire content production things out there now that are like dedicated almost exclusively to, to throwing gasoline, you know, on these fires. And I think, you know, it, it <laughs> no one goes into this business uh, thinking that, you know, it, 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 you, you can have thin skin and, and, and sort of make through it. But, you know, we shouldn't have to deal with this kind of stuff. And like, we should, you know, we shouldn't accept it as just the way of things that, you know, there's going to be all these people out there who, who are making it, you know, their life's work to, to stoke tensions, you know, I, I think that, you know, sometimes with journalists, there's kind of a tendency to close ranks and say, well, you know, like they're journalists too. And like, they're just doing the job. And I, you know, I don't agree with that. I mean, I think we should call out, you know, like OAN and Newsmax and all these people for peddling nonsense. And, you know, I, yeah, that, you know, that's sort of my view on it. And those hearings reminded us that that nonsense can get pretty dangerous and pretty deadly. Um, and that coverage will continue. Sarah close from you. Um, yeah, so I think that we should also recognize that racism and capitalism go hand in hand have, and have always gone hand in hand since this nation's inception. You know, this, this country was built, the economic foundation of this country was built on racial subjugation and a hierarchy, a, a racial hierarchy that put black people at the, at the bottom. Um, so what we and and there is a, a a serious serious effort to maintain power it's all about power and control and when power is 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 being questioned or um sharing power or losing your grip on power is uh something that is at the the forefront in conversation whether it's around uh understanding the true history of this country under the guise of critical race theory or, or, or dismantling critical race theory, anything that challenges white male domination in this country is going to be um, combated with, with serious, serious force. And so I'm not dissuaded, I'm not concerned, I'm not um, you know, scared by the commentary that we see in, in whatever, in Facebook, in Twitter, Twitter, whatever, because that is who this country is. That is, that is who this country is. And people are grasping to, to hold on to power and control. And as you see black and brown and women and, and people um, becoming more and more empowered and emboldened, then you're going to have even more uh, a, 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 a fiercer and even fiercer fight to hold on to power. And so my hope is that younger generations, um, you know, they're they're comp they're it's it's very difficult in this mass media culture that we're in, where you know there's so much that's coming at us all the time, and you can silo your information very easily. But there's also a democratization of information as well with all of that. So my hope is that um, we will continue doing the work, like like Mitra said. We will just continue to rise, as Julissa said, and just um, you know do the the good journalism, like Felipe said, that has to be done no matter what. And we persevere because that's what we've done for centuries. So it wasn't easy for Freedom to Journal either. Um, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, I want to close just by talking about the impact that journalism can have. Uh, last week's episode, if people watched the show focused on the closure of the country's largest and one of the last manufacturers of generic pharmaceuticals. A big plant, 2,000 people, well-paid in the middle of Morgantown, West Virginia, was scheduled to be closed yesterday. 
had a loss of 2,000 jobs, many of them union jobs, and there had been silence from the White House and from uh, the Senate office of Joe Manchin, uh, one of the most powerful senators in the country, the Democrat representing uh, Morgantown. He had a very close relationship with this factory. His daughter ran it for many years. She left with a $30 million golden parachute shortly before the merger that led to the scheduled closure. The plant, we don't know where things stand today because yesterday the word came to us that Joe Manchin finally, after a bunch of media attention that I have to say we stoked as the only national television show to cover this story, um, the coverage seems to have been prompting him to act. And he has reached out to a part of the Department of Homeland Security that covers infrastructure security and gotten the plant registered as a critical component of our um, security state, as it were. Now, I don't know really what that means or whether that means it will just be sitting there, it can't be bulldozed, or whether the jobs will be retained. But for everybody that has been helping to amplify that story over the last uh, week, I thank you. And I think the people of Beatrice Milan, the factory, and of Morgantown more generally, may um, see some positive outcomes to the attention and the journalism that many of us brought to that story. So that's just a reminder that the work does make a difference, maybe, um, and that we do it regardless, um, backwards and in high heels and um, having been dehumanized for centuries. Regardless, we do it. And I thank you, all of you, for participating. We'll be back in a month with another BIPOC Meet the Media, Meet the BIPOC Press uh, episode. But of course, next week, the Laura Flanders Show will be back as ever. So promote it and um, subscribe, and we'll see you then. And thank you all for your incredible journalism. It makes a big difference. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.